Niagara Falls is an awe-inspiring land. The sheer power of the Niagara River is on full display as it smashes over the fall. However, another example of the destructive power of the Gorge Carving River is on display just a short distance from the Falls Visitor Center. It is the site of a ruin. Not just any ruins, it is what remains of a hydroelectric plant. Not much remains, but way back in 1956, a catastrophic failure occurred in a vital hydroelectric power station. Today we're looking at the Sholkov power station collapse. My name is John, and welcome to Plainly Difficult. This video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my Patreon and YouTube members. If you'd like to see my videos early access and ad free, then why not give it a try? Oh, and also whilst you're there, how about you chuck the channel a subscribe? It really helps me out greatly. Mr. Schelkopf. This is Jacob Friedrich Schelkopf. He was born in the Kingdom of Wittenberg, modern day southern Germany. Way back in 1819, at the age of 22, he emigrated to the United States. Over the years, he built up wealth and invested in various industries. In 1870, he bought the Frontier Mills of Buffalo, New York. Over the following years, he would buy more milling companies in the area. Now, while Sholkopf had been building up his business empire, a project to the north of Buffalo near the Niagara Falls was unfolding. The Niagara River offered an opportunity to the industries in the area. That was a powerful renewable energy source. You see, rivers have been used for hydropower for thousands of years, and in the 1800s, industrialization in full swing, a plan was set out to create a canal to tap into the river's flow, entering before the falls and exiting after downstream. The canal had no lining to it, which allowed water from it to enter the water table. This offered a tremendous power source for the mills. However, the project became mired in multiple financial issues and the small thing of the Civil War. As such, when completed in the 1860s, the canal only had one customer. The canal's owner, the Niagara Falls Canal Company, shuffled along into bankruptcy in 1877 where it be bought up by your man Jacob Friedrich Scholkopf for a grand sum of around $71,000, which is about a couple of million dollars in today's money. The canal had a power plant named Number 1 since 1874. This didn't make any electrical power. Instead, it powered its clients with belts and drive shafts. Scholkopf's next set about making use of the canal for generating electrical power. Initially, Sholkopf partnered with Charles Francis Brush. He had operated the first dynamo in Niagara Falls. The original electrical output was fairly low at around 1800 horsepower. The first plant ran until 1904 and was closed after a second plant was in full swing. The second power station was opened in 1884 and boasted an output of 34,000 horsepower. But this too wouldn't be enough when plans were laid out for a third and final power station in the area. Sholkopf wouldn't get to see the final station, as a little obstacle got in the way. He stopped being alive. Station number three would be built over three sections, labelled as A, B and C, between 1914 and 1924. It would house 21 generators, boasting a total power output of 454,500 horsepower. The final section, 3C, was built in front of the old power station, making it the largest privately owned hydroelectric station in the world at the time. The canal was deemed to have not enough capacity for the new station, so a tunnel was built. Water passed along the tunnel, entered a penstock and flowed down towards the turbine inlet, where the water turns the turbine, which then turns the generator, after which the water is returned to the flow of the Niagara just below the falls. The sides of the gorge behind the power station were walled off to prevent water from seeping in between the structure. Now the structure had to be strong as the weight and pressure of the water is immense. I mean, you'd want it to be as that's what creates the power. But sadly the strength wasn't quite enough and that's what we'll see in the disaster. It is the morning of the 7th of June 1956 and workers at the Sholkopf power station have noticed cracks in the wall towards the rear of the generating station. Throughout the day, the cracks started to get wider. The workers used sandbags to try and stop 
water entering the building. By the afternoon, the cracks were getting bigger and bigger. Workers started to escape the building. By 5pm, rocks from above the power station separated from the bluff and crashed into the roof of the building. Water quickly started gushing from the now formed hole in the gorge wall, blasting down into the river. Parts of the building during this were washed away. Over the space of just 10 minutes, five large rocks had separated and fallen, weighing an estimated 120,000 tonnes. The entire southern portion of the plant had been crushed and washed away. During this time, one person was killed from falling debris, with a number of others severely injured. The collapse caused an entire blackout of the plant's power generation. The disaster caused over $100 million of damage, not including the amount of economic damage caused by the sudden loss of some 400,000 kilowatts of power. With such a drop in power, the deficit had to be made up. Interestingly, power was sourced from the Hydroelectric Power Commission of Ontario, Canada, across the border. However, that was still not enough. Power was then sourced from a steam generating station in Buffalo, New York. This is all good and all, but it came at a much larger financial cost. As well, the fuel had to be paid for and burnt. At around the same time, water was still billowing out of the now non-existent southern section of the station. The collapse had damaged the lower end of the penstock for stations 3B and C. This was not good, as water continued to flow. Workers managed to close off some of the head gates of 3A. This reduced some flow until an emergency generator was sourced to try and power the rest of the head gate shut. But even after power was provided, the flow couldn't be fully stopped. It wouldn't take until the 16th of June before the flow could be finally stemmed via the installation of a cofferdam and the forcing shut of the leaf gates of the pressure tunnel. Even then, some water still continued to flow. Eventually, 3A was partially restored and brought back into electricity generation. This part of the power station was the least damaged from the disaster. However, it wouldn't last too much further, being closed in the early 1960s. But what was the cause? Well, let's try and find out. The aftermath. So once the flow of the water was stemmed, debris could be removed and a decimated power station could be evaluated. Amazingly, for the time, there are multiple very striking photographs of the disaster as it unfolded. Initially, the failure began slightly to the south of the power station. This was quickly followed by the failure behind the power station on the gorge wall, then the following rockfalls and destruction of the station. But what was the cause of the initial rockfall? Well, there were a couple of theories, as pointed out in Power and Energy magazine. The first, and I think most likely, is from an increase in ground pressure from some works being done near the power station leading up to the disaster. You see, the unlined hydraulic canal had allowed water to seep into the banks and into the water table. This had subsequently weakened the ground. To combat this, engineers had started to install a thing called a grout curtain behind the power station on the high bank. Work had begun in May 1956, and by the time of the collapse, was well underway. This might have increased the pressure on the ground as holes were drilled and pumped with grout. Interestingly, the place where this work was being done was, you guessed it, behind the power station right near Section 3C. Pretty convincing. Another cause might have been from an earlier minor earthquake, which could have changed the elasticity of the rock behind the station. We may never know fully what the actual cause was, but what we do know is that the end of the Sholkov power station happened after some 60 years of energy creation. Not much remains at the site. It was cleared to beautify the US side of the Niagara River. Which is a bit of a shame really, as that would have been quite a nice place to urban explore. Right, so it is scale time. It's going to be a free, and this is what I've got for my root cause analysis card. Do you agree? This is a Plain Default production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Default videos produced by me, John, in the currently fairly cold corner of Southern London, UK. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching. And Mr. Music, play us out, please. <laughs>